It's really good to be with you tonight, and uh, I'm excited to uh, spend some time in the Word of God with you. So let's take our Bibles and let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16 tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I want to encourage you with uh, some thoughts from that chapter. And just want to say thank you, of course, for your prayers for us at City Baptist. And uh, it's really exciting to see God continuing to work down there in South Vancouver. And uh, we just are so grateful for you, our, uh, our sending church. And keep praying for us. And uh, keep asking the Lord to do some great things. It's been really great to see uh, some people saved recently, getting ready to baptize again. Um, I believe we've, we've added uh, almost 30 members to the church just in the last few months. And so it's been a really, uh, now I'm too loud. It's, gonna, it's, really, uh, it's been a really great thing to experience and see God moving in that way. And so we just want to praise God for that. Well, we're in 1 Samuel 16 tonight. And I want to give you a little bit of uh, context to the passage where we are before we get to sort of the main thought. Um, But before we get into it this evening, I want to ask you a quick question, okay? And this might seem like an odd question. Uh, Please uh, please don't shout out any answers at this point. But if you were in charge, think about this for a moment. If you were in charge of picking Canada's next prime minister, (laughs) you're like, oh yeah, here we go, (laughs) okay? I'm not going to say who it would be, because hopefully you would say Pastor Connor, obviously, right? (laughs) Obviously. Uh, But if you were in charge of making that decision for whatever strange, odd reason you were given that that position and you were to decide who it was to be who's to lead our country, I wonder what kind of characteristics you would be looking for. What kind of things would you, what kind of questions would you ask of that individual? What uh, what kind of appearance or uh, presence or speaking ability would you be looking for? You know, I think it'd be interesting that if we put policies aside, I think for many of us, if we were to go around the room and say, what are you looking for in uh, the next prime minister of Canada? Uh, If we leave policy aside, we'll just stop there, okay? We leave that aside. And uh, some of our many issues with our current prime minister, if we leave those things aside, I think interestingly enough, many of us would come to some of the same conclusions of what we're looking for. Uh, We might describe a person very similar to one another, and really what it is is because uh, for all of us when it comes to the idea of leadership, somebody that we want to be in a position of uh, of authority, someone who we want to follow, many of us have some of the same characteristics in mind, some of the same ideology of how we would imagine that person to be. And I think if we were to articulate that, we would find a lot of similarities, Now, I want you to keep that image in your mind as we head into the message this evening, because as we return or as we go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 tonight, uh, I want to remind us about the current state of the nation of Israel up until this point. If you know anything at all about the first few chapters here, the first 15 chapters of, uh, of, of 1 Samuel, a unique situation took place in, in, uh, in the country where the people demanded, and they said to Samuel, now Samuel was the final prophet, uh, he was the one who was in charge uh, of the country at this point, up until this point, of course God had been leading the nation uh, with God as their king, and there had been some prophets and priests and judges uh, that had come along to represent God uh, to the nation. But an interesting thing happened back in chapter 8 where the people came to Samuel and they said, Samuel, you're old, which is never a great way to start a conversation. Just, you know, don't ever go to your parents like that. Hey, just want you to know you're old and here's my request. They already know what it's going to be. But don't ever start a conversation like that. But that's how it goes. They come to Samuel, they say, Samuel, you are old, and we have decided, they didn't talk to him about it, but they said, we have decided that we want a king over Israel. Maybe you remember that from a story as a a child in Sunday school, but they came to him and they said, we want a king. And interestingly enough, the people did not say, "Uh, Samuel, we want a king that is like our God. They did not say, we want a godly king. They, in fact, said, we want a king just like the other nations. Do you remember that? And they said, we want a king just like everybody else. Now, the problem with that request, though to you and I, it maybe seems harmless. Like, what's the big deal? God's give them a king. That's what they want. The reason it's a problem is because the nations around them were pagan. Think about it. They were pagan, idolatrous nations who, in fact, hated Israel and wanted Israel to be destroyed. 
I mean, it'd be like today if we were like, hey, you know, name me your, your top, you know, three examples for prime minister of Canada. And you're just like, definitely, we need a little North Korea dictator in there. You know, like we need a little Kim Jong in there uh, to fit out, you know, sort of fill everything out. That's what we need. That's what it would be like. Somebody wants to destroy us and, uh, and wants to bring the end of Western civilization. That's basically what they're saying. We want a king. Uh, that is going to be like all of these pagans around us. And so they come to Samuel, and Samuel, of course, is, is distraught by it. But yet God uh, allows them to make that odd decision for themselves. And where we are now, chapter 15, uh, is a terrible chapter to read through. Uh, and, and as we come to chapter 16, basically what we see is Israel is living in the reality of that decision. They're living in the reality of a person that chose something outside the will of God for their life. Now, maybe some of you can relate to that. You've lived parts of your life where you were outside of God's will, and you made decisions that you know went against his word, and you know went, went against what God uh, desired for you, and then you had to live in the consequences of that. Well, that's where we're at right now because the people got the king they wanted. And even though God told Samuel, warned them about King Saul, King Saul was the guy that was chosen, uh, he's going to tax you, he's going to take your children, uh, he's going to put them to labor, he, you're going to be in war, you're, it's going to be a, tr a struggle. In fact, all of those things came true, and what we see throughout uh, the, the first part of 1 Samuel is Saul uh, progressed into a very wicked king. He did not care about the people. The only thing that he cared about and was concerned about was his own glory. It was not about the glory of God. It was not about the glory or the, the benefit of the people. It was all about himself. And so it was just a few years into his reign that God made it very clear, the kingdom is no longer yours, Saul. And there was a very unique situation and story where uh, Samuel came to him and they had this big, this big conversation and Samuel decided to leave. He said, uh, God, you know, God's done with you. And he started to leave and Saul, you know, grabbed his robe and he tore off a piece of it. And Samuel, like in the most cinematic moment ever, you know, turns to him and says, just like this was torn from my robe, God will tear the kingdom from you. It was, a, it was, it was epic. You had to be there. It was amazing. I wish I could have been there. It was incredible. And so Saul, this neurotic, crazy guy, this king, uh, is, per, is really spiraling out of control. God had said to him, you're no longer going to be the king. And while he was king in person, God was in fact setting up and looking for and had chosen already another king who would reflect his heart. He had already chosen somebody who would be that example of the perfect king who was to come, Jesus Christ himself. And so this is the situation right here. Samuel is still uh, the, the main uh, prophet for the nation. Of course, Saul is still the king. He's still acting as the king, though the kingdom had been taken from him. And now we have Samuel, and we come to verse uh, chapter uh, 16, where we see this search for a true king begin. And that's really the title of my message tonight is God's requirement for a king. But first, I want us to see a failed plan for a king. A failed plan for a king. Look with me at verse number 1 of 1 Samuel uh, chapter uh, 16. It says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? This is the key phrase. He says, How long are you going to mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Then he says, Fill thy horn with oil and go and uh, uh, go and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So what we see here is the Lord coming to Samuel, and Samuel is in a state of mourning. I don't know if you noticed that there. Samuel, this prophet of God, is in a state of distress. The king that he had anointed, the king that he was responsible to train and to, to really to lead to positions of greatness, had turned out to be a failure. He was nothing at all like the king that Samuel had hoped for. He was nothing at all like the leader that Israel needed that Samuel's own mother had actually talked about in her prayer back in the beginning of the book. He was nothing like that at all. He was a dismal failure. And so what we see is we see Samuel in Gilgal and he's mourning for Saul. That word mourning there is the idea of grieving. So he's in this place and he's grieving. He's sorrowful and he's upset. Now we might be thinking, what is the problem here, Samuel? Why are you mourning over a guy who just completely has, you know, said, man, forget God and forget what God's told me to do. I'm just going to do my own thing. Why would he be mourning for him? Well, I believe the reason is because he was mourning the unrealized expectations of the king. He was depressed. He was discouraged because things did not work out the way he had hoped for. He was frustrated, I think. 
Saul, this king that had so much potential, had disappointed him, and the failure of Saul brought Samuel to the point of grief. Now, I think we can all relate to this in this regard, because so often in life, there's a struggle where we find ourselves sometimes discouraged and grieving and sorrowing about the unrealized expectations of our past. Maybe you found yourself in that situation before where you found yourself at a position of almost grief over unrealized expectations. Or maybe you found yourself in that position simply because of the unrealized expectations that you had of somebody else. Maybe the past life that you live that continually comes back to your mind. Or maybe a person that has hurt you or or a family member that has disappointed you. And you're sorrowing and you're grieving because of that difficulty in your life. This is what Samuel was doing. He was grieving over the loss of this king. Well, God comes to him, and I don't know if you saw that there in the verse, but he says, and he says to him, how long are you going to mourn for him? Now, if it was you and I going there today to Samuel, we said, Samuel, what is your problem? (laughs) Get it together, man. Like, hey, it's okay. Let's move on. God is much nicer. He asks it in a question. How long are you going to mourn? You know, it gives him an opportunity to say like, ah, just six more months. You know, that's all I need. And he says, but really what he's saying is, come on, I've got something for you to do. I have something that I want you to be a part of. And so he comes to him and he says, hey, uh, listen, it's over. It's in the past. It's not your responsibility any longer. You're not responsible for him. I've already decided to take the kingdom from him. And so I want you to uh, get your horn. I want you to fill it up with oil. I want you to put a cap on it so you don't spill any out of it. And I want you to move forward and do something for me. He said, it's time to move forward. Now, I stop here for a moment because I believe that sometimes the Lord uses these stories and these narratives in Scripture to challenge us with those same kind of thoughts. And maybe for some of you tonight, maybe it's time for some of you to move forward a little bit. Maybe it's time for some of you to move past your past. That person that hurt you, that past sin life that you lived in, that you are constantly going back to and beating yourself up over, even though Jesus died for those sins and has forgiven you of those sins. That person that maybe currently right now is mistreating you and you're struggling and you don't know how you're going to get through this. But yet God might be trying to tell you tonight and and to learn from this. You don't have to live in mourning and grieving in that. Don't stay around like Samuel was. He just sat around in Gilgal just mourning that. God has something better for you. God has something better for you. And this is what we see here with Samuel. God comes to him and he says, it's time for you to stop mourning. Get your stuff together and let's get going because God already had somebody else picked out as that king. And I love this as we come to verse number two. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. (laughs) And the Lord said, take a heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord and call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Now, I don't think we fully understand the tension that is in Samuel's life at this point. Just think about it for a moment. He had just had a a whole blow up with an angry, neurotic, uh, passive aggressive, uh, and aggressive guy. And he had said to him, you are no longer going to be the king. And so Saul uh, definitely internalized that, and he would not have been happy about that announcement. So here we have Saul, the guy with the power to literally just take somebody's life at at any time for any reason, That was one of the issues with having a king rather than uh, the the system of justice that God had set up. And so Samuel's sitting there and he's thinking, if if anyone finds out, now think about it for a moment. Samuel told Saul, there's going to be another king. It's, you're not the king any longer. So Saul would have known that Samuel would have been the one, as the prophet, he would have been the one who would have had the, the job of anointing the next king. So don't you think, I certainly believe this, that Saul had people watching Samuel at all times. We know that about Saul, Saul, how often he would send out spies. We know this later on uh, with David. He would have spies. He had people all over, like the Mossad today, you know, in Israel. They had spies everywhere. And so Samuel says, God, if I go out and I just take my horn of oil, my anointing uh, horn, and I'm just like, you know, let's go. Let's go find somebody. I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. What am I going to do? And so understand the tension here, but God is way ahead of things, and I love that. Isn't it amazing sometimes you're so fearful, but God's already got it worked out, or he already has a plan for you, and we see that here. So he tells him, he says, take this heifer, take this ox with you, and I want you to go and plan to make sacrifice for the Lord in Bethlehem. In today's terms, we would say this, God just gave Samuel an alibi. 
You know what I mean? He just gave him an alibi. He says, here's what you're going to say or what you're going to go do. There's also something going to be happening behind the scenes, but at least for Saul, he just, he thinks you're going to do, give a sacrifice. I love how God thinks. And so he says, I want you to go to Bethlehem. I want you to have a sacrifice and that would prevent uh, any kind of arousal of suspicion. And of course, for, for Samuel, this is a common thing that he would have done. Obviously, he'd been in Gilgal for quite a while. But he would do this. He would go to towns and, and places, and he would hold court. He would deal with legal matters. Uh, he would offer sacrifices. I, I learned this. This is very interesting. Uh, he would often go to places, and if there was an unsolved murder in a town, he would go and offer a sacrifice to atone for the sins of that unsolved murder. Oftentimes, what would happen is God would reveal who it truly was. Very interesting. And so it was not uncommon for him, though, to go to different places and and have a a sacrifice. And so God says, go to Bethlehem and have this sacrifice. And it would have been a big affair. The entire uh, entire city would have come out to this arena, of course, and been a part of it. But Samuel's primary job, get this, in all of this was to ensure, notice what the verses said, that Jesse, a guy by the name of Jesse, He was to make sure that Jesse and his sons were there because God says, I've chosen one of his sons. He names Jesse, but he doesn't name which son. And he says, I've chosen one of his sons to be the next king. And so we see as we continue in verse 4 that Samuel did that which the Lord spake. And he came to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming. And they said, come as thou peaceably. (laughs) And he said, peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and he called them to the sacrifice. Now Samuel gets there, and the people are afraid. They're trembling, you know? Uh, Why is that? Why would they be so afraid? Well, there's a couple of things I think you need to consider. First of all, they know that Samuel's at odds with the king, right? They know that he had just told the king, you're done. It's over, you know? Like, you're not going to be the king any longer. And so uh, Samuel uh, was at odds with the king. So if Samuel comes to your village, then possibly the king would think there's something going on there, right? And so they were afraid. Like, oh man, the king's going to come after us. Another reason could be that uh, they were afraid that there was some crime or a sin in their, in their town that nobody knew about. And here came Samuel. He's going he's gonna to expose it, right? It's like, you know, you ever get that phone call after you did something wrong from your parents? And you're like, how did they know? You know, how did they know I did that? That wasn't me at all. But, you know, maybe one of you, you experienced that. Just trying to relate. Uh, The third reason that they might have been worried is about a certain situation that happened with Samuel and a king Agag. I don't know if you remember that story. That was in chapter 15. After Saul did not obey the Lord and destroy the Amalekites as he should, which was a fulfillment of the prophecy back from Deuteronomy because the Amalekites, this is really cool. The Amalekites, when Israel was on their way to the promised land, they had come up behind the people that were traveling where some of the weak and the the slower travelers, the elderly were, and they had slaughtered a great deal of people, children and and elderly and those that had uh, had. Uh, disabilities, and they'd come from behind and killed them. And God said, there's going to be judgment brought upon you. And this was the fulfillment of that, of God's remembering of that and bringing judgment by using Israel to bring judgment to those people. Now, Saul did not do what he was supposed to do, did he? And he left the king. Well, at the end of the whole thing, Samuel, as like an 80-year-old guy is what we figure, went in there and he cut him in pieces. Snaps, right? (laughs) That's what we used to say when I was young. You guys don't say that anymore, though. (laughs) It used to be cool. I mean, that's, that's incredible. So imagine now, that story would have gotten out. And so now here comes Samuel, right, coming to your town. Okay. And so they're afraid and they're terrified. And he says, no, it's okay. I'm coming in peace. I'm just here to have a sacrifice. But notice, I want you to pick up on this in the verse here. He said to them, I've come peaceably. I'm come to sacrifice in the Lord. And then he says this. What are those two words? Same with me. He says, sanctify yourselves. I didn't hear anybody. Let's say it. Sanctify yourselves. This is interesting. He tells everybody to sanctify themselves in preparation for the sacrifice. Now, this was a common thing. To sanctify yourself uh, for that moment. Of course, the word sanctify means to set apart. But what it was is that every individual would have to take a bath. That's a good thing. Okay? You'd have this ritual uh, bath. You'd have to put on some clean clothes. You would have to abstain from intimate relationships for a time, and you were to avoid contact with any dead body. You can see that in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. all talk about those things. But more important, understand, 
More important than the outward rituals of cleansing oneself, a person was to seek the Lord for spiritual cleansing by confessing and repenting of their sins. The outward acts of sanctification uh, or cleansing were merely, merely symbols of something that was to be done inwardly. Here's the thought that I want us to consider. Before they came to the sacrifice, before they came to worship, they were already sanctified. Here's what I mean by that. Before they came to worship the Lord, they were right with the Lord. I think that's just a great principle for us, don't you? That's a great principle. You know, sometimes we look at church and we come to church and we're like, hey, fix me, church, right? I've been living like the devil all week, so I'm going to come to church on Sunday and, you know, I'm going to get all fixed, right? <laughs> fix me up, Lord. Okay, now there's an element of that. There's an element of encouragement that comes and challenge. Of course, we know that. But imagine if you came to church on Sunday already set apart, already right with the Lord. I mean, you're ready to go. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? You're cleansed. Your heart is ready. I'll tell you what, you would probably get more out of the services than you're getting right now. And in fact, I know that. I know that for a fact. I know that for a fact. You'd, you'd be able to experience and enjoy Christian fellowship at a new level and a deeper level. You'd find ways that God would speak to you like maybe he's never spoken to you before. And so the principle here, I think, is really helpful for us that before the worship, before the sacrifice, there must be the sanctification. And I don't know, if that, maybe that'll help some of you as you head into the services this week on Wednesday night and next Sunday, that before you come, even just take a moment in your car, a Sunday morning uh, while you're sitting there, you know, and just spend some time in prayer, confess sin and get right with the Lord even before you come. It's amazing what God can do in your life when you are ready. And so Samuel goes to them and he says, listen, I want you to be, to be sanctified and to be ready for the sacrifice. And so he does all of these things. The people are told to be ready. He has the sacrifice there. Samuel, of course, made sure that Jesse and his sons, you know, had the VIP lanyards, you know, so that they could come and meet with him. You got to think there's a lot of people there. We don't know how it all happened, uh, but somehow Jesse and his sons were invited to meet with Samuel. And so here we go, and we come to this point where Samuel, being led by God, is looking to anoint the next king. But this brings us to our second point. Because even though Samuel was being led by God, I want you to notice that Samuel had his own idea for what a king should be. Samuel had his own plans for a king. Notice in verse number six. And it came to pass uh, when they were come that he looked on Eliab. Who's Eliab? It's the oldest son of Jesse. So when they were come that he looked on Eliab and he said this, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Now, this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting uh, I guess, just uh, unrolling of events here. Because for all of Samuel's correction to Saul, not that long ago, telling him to wait on the Lord and don't act irrationally, as soon as uh, Eliab comes into the tent, I imagine maybe there was a tent set aside for Samuel or some sort of a covering, you know. And as soon as Eliab kind of, uh, you know, kind of walks into the tent, Samuel's like, that's the Lord's anointed. Maybe he was busy or he had to, you know, wanted to eat or something. But he's like... All right, this is the guy. Let's make it happen, okay? I know who he is. It's Eliab. He's the next king for sure. And, and, you, and to, uh, you and I, we say, why would he say that? What is it about Eliab that as soon as he enters the situation that Samuel's like, this is the guy. I know he's the guy. Well, God tells us in verse number seven. In verse number seven, and the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him. That's pretty strong wording there. Why did he refuse him? For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on, say that word with me, the heart. The heart. See, the way that God responded here tells us how Samuel was approaching this assignment. He was looking at the outward appearance. So when Eliab came in, and I imagine, it says, don't look at his, his countenance, don't look on the height of his stature. So, you know, I imagine as, as Eliab comes in, and, uh, you know, maybe they're in a tent, and he has to kind of duck, you know, to get into the tent, right? And as he walks, he just kind of see his rippling, bulging muscles, right? And he kind of walks in, he's like, sup, Samuel, right, you know? And Samuel's like, woo, <laughs> you know, it's the next king, man, it's the next king. You know, that's what they did with Saul, did you know that? Saul, it says that he was, he was more handsome than anyone in all of Israel. And then in the same verse, it says it again. He was more handsome twice. It says he's doubly handsome. I mean, it was like, whoo, like, that guy is so good looking, right? Amazing, right? Not in a weird way, but he's just so good looking. 
Ah, well, this is the guy we want to be our king. And that's Eliab. He walks in and Samuel's like, that's the guy. Man, he's huge. He could probably fight Saul, maybe one-on-one, you know. He could take him. And he sees him and he's, and he's huge and, he's, and he looks good and all of this kind of stuff, the tangible things. That's what he's looking at. He's looking at the things that he could see on the outside, but God comes in and he says, it's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for somebody who has all of the outward appearance. I'm looking for somebody that would be a picture of the Messiah to come. I'm not looking for the same things that you're looking for, is what God is saying here. Now, Samuel's approach here is a good example for us how we often approach life ourselves, isn't it? We're so outwardly focused. We're so concerned with how somebody looks. We're so concerned with their position. We're so concerned with their income. You know, it's interesting that uh, recent studies have done that show that in just a few seconds of time, when you meet somebody new, your brain is already forming a perception of that person. In other words, within just a few seconds, there's been studies that have showed in less than a second of you meeting a new person for the first time, you've already created a judgment of them in your own mind. That's crazy. (laughs) That's crazy. They say on average anywhere from three to seven seconds is kind of where you land, uh, where the hidden subliminal mind uh, takes that data just by looking at a person, and it already begins to uh, inform a position. It employs factors such as their body language, their voice, their clothing, their appearance, their, your perceived social category for them. And while there's so many different factors and reasons why we do that, it is something as Christians we must always fight against because that is not how God does things. That is the world's philosophy. A worldly philosophy is the person that looks at the outside of someone and, and makes a judgment call on whether or not they are someone God can use. Does that make sense? And we're guilty of this as a church. We're guilty of this. You know, we look at uh, people within the church and we might even decide in our own minds whether or not, even if they say, I feel God's called me to ministry, and right away you're like, nah, I don't know. You ever done that to somebody? Maybe, they're, maybe God's doing a work in their life, but because they don't maybe fit the mold of who you think they should be or what you think they should be, we cast judgment upon them. And God is just destroying that mindset right now. He's saying it's not about how somebody looks. I am looking for something far more important. I want to do a quick experiment with you guys, okay? I'm going to show you a picture, and I want you to to throw some judgment. Is that okay? You're like, yeah, some of you, that's my spiritual gift, right? Judgment. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that's a real one. Okay, so I'm going to put a picture on the screen, okay? Now, some of you are going to know where I'm going with this, but I'm just going to put a picture on the screen here for you, okay, of two men. Now, one of these men in this photo, one of these men in this photo, almost every Sunday preaches to almost 5,000 people. One of these men in this photo, through his ministry, has seen almost 1,000 churches planted. Almost 1,000 churches. Think about that for a moment. We're like Brother Marty, right? (laughs) One church, amen? Okay, imagine this. Almost a 1,000 churches planted during his ministry time. Now, you guys are way ahead of me because you're like, okay, of course, you know, we'll pick the opposite. Not the big, strong, bald guy, right? This is Dr. Rick Martin. He's a missionary in the Philippines. If you figure that out by Elo Elo Baptist Church there, right? And he's been there since 1977 where he planted his first church and started a Bible college and huge ministry. How many of you ever met him or heard him before? Anyone? Okay, a few of you have maybe heard of him before. I got to meet him uh, when I was in Bible college, and he came and preached uh, there at West Coast. And, and I remember sitting there, you know, as a, as a 21-year-old guy, and as he kind of walked out onto the stage, I was like, who is this guy? I'm serious. That was in my mindset. Because, I mean, he's skinny. Like, he's really skinny, and he's really short, and he's always dealing with health issues. And he walks out there, and I didn't know anything about him. And I remember in my mind thinking, like, who, who, like, did they run out of speakers today? Like, you know, who, who is this guy coming to preach to us? And then as I heard him speak and saw his heart and heard his story, I was just completely blown away by what God has done in his life. Because for 45 years, God has been using him in a way that, I mean, any of us would just, just can't even imagine how God has used him. 
The point I, I want us to understand, and I believe what God is trying to get across to us, is God doesn't work in the way that we always think he does. And so while Samuel, the prophet of God, had a certain mindset of what a king should be, God says, no, not at all. <laughs> which brings us to our final thought, which is God's plan for a king. Okay, what is God's plan for a king? Let's quickly uh, look at this here in verse number 8. As Jesse called Abinadab, that's the second, made him pass before Samuel, and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by, and he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, uh, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. Now, we're not given specific reasons why Eliab, Abinadab, Shammah, or the rest are rejected. Outwardly, I think probably all of them would have been qualified to fill the position of king. But here we see God is concerned about the heart. And so God weighs their hearts and he finds them lacking. And so one by one, uh, Jesse brings his sons, uh, you know, through. And every single one, Samuel shoots them down. He's like, no, nope, no, nope, you know, I don't think so. You know, and it says that he, he didn't even say their names. He says, God has not chosen this. You know, that's kind of interesting. God has not chosen this. Move him along, you know. It's kind of like, I heard one person describe it this way. It's kind of like an Old Testament version of Cinderella, you know? There's the glass slipper of the kingdom, you know? And, and everybody's walking by, but as they walk by, it just doesn't work out, you know? It's, just, it's not going to fit. And uh, they're all hopeful that they can fit their foot in the king, you know? Because they know what's going on, but it doesn't happen. Well, they're all standing around awkwardly, feeling awkward like you are right now with this photo. And... Samuel looks to Jesse and he asks him a weird question. He says, hey, uh, is there any way you forgot any of your kids? <laughs> is there any way? Now, I won't ask you parents how many of you have done that. Forgot your kids in a mall or a store or a church. <laughs> but sure enough, Jesse did forget. Let's continue. And Samuel said to Jesse, are here all thy children? He said, uh, uh, there, there remains one, yet the youngest. Yes, that's right. Uh, but behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. We're not going to do anything. We're not even going to sit down until he comes here. And so he sent him and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now it seems like Jesse's caught off guard. Uh, wait a minute. What, what do you mean we don't have, uh, do I have any other kids? Yes, I got one more. And he's out there watching the sheep. Now immediately just in this passage, we learn a lot about David, okay? The first thing that I want us to notice here that implies to us that he doesn't seem fit to be a king is, first of all, his position as a shepherd. I mean, the ones who were watching the sheep, uh, it's not coveted position in Israel. Slaves, often social rejects. Uh, the ones who didn't want to be around people were the ones who were shepherds. It was demanding, uh, but it did not require a ton of real skill. Most everyone could pick up that skill set. And so he was doing a job that wasn't necessarily uh, befitting of the future king of the country. The second aspect that is working against him is the way that his dad describes him. He says that he is the youngest. The English translation that we have from the Greek word there, katan, which means literally the youngest, but it also carries the connotation of the tiniest or the smallest. Like he's, like, he's an itty bitty guy is what he's saying. He's just, a, he's just a little guy, you know? And then notice the physical description. He was ruddy. He had a beautiful countenance and goodly to look upon. Now, as Western reader, readers, we look at that. We're like, oh, that's kind of cool. He sounds like a good looking kid. No, I think we are misunderstanding it. These are not uh, complimentary attributes. He's not complimenting him at all. Because what he's saying, the author is pointing out that David it says that he was ruddy. That means he was, he was fair skinned. That means he gets sunburned really easily. And he says that he had this goodly complexion. Yes, it can mean that he was, uh, he was maybe had the potential to be good looking. But at this point, here's what it means. It means that he was just like a cute little kid. You know, like, aw, <laughs> right? you know, <laughs> look at little David. You know, he's so cute. Look at him. He's so cute. Look at him. He's all sunburned, right? He's been out in the sun and he's been watching the sheep. It's so cute to see him. Now, he points him out because he wants us to know that David here looked more like a cute little kid than he did the mighty warrior king that he would become. And so the text is intending to show to us that David was outwardly unimpressive. Outwardly, he was not impressive at all whatsoever. Essentially, he is the runt of the family. He's like an afterthought. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Him, <laughs> you know, oh yeah, we have another son. I, I totally forgot. Think about it. His dad didn't even invite him to the sacrifice. Think about that. 
You know, he's like, wow, Samuel is bringing our, you know, if you got invited to some like big time event and they're like, bring your whole family. You'd be like, yeah, I want my kids to be there. I want them to experience. They get to see the prophet. Maybe the only time in their lifetime they're going to see the prophet. But he doesn't even bring him. He's like, <laughs> just he stay out with the sheep. The rest of you guys, come on, guys, let's go. Man, that, that, that tells you about how he was viewed. He was the runt of the family. But there was something about David that made him kingly material. And it was not what could be seen, it was what could not be seen. And God made it so clear back in verse number seven. He says, the Lord, or the man, he says, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. See, when God looks at an individual, he is not impressed by our outward appearance. It doesn't even register with God as a relevant quality. God does not look down at us and say, Man, you've been hitting the gym? You're looking pretty good. <laughs> God does not look at us and say, sweet haircut. Man, that's great. Good fit today. Man, you really put it all together nicely. God, God does not think in that way. God does not think in that way at all because God looks at our hearts because that is what he values more than anything else. Now, in one sense, for all of us, this is good news, because for us, when we look at ourselves and we uh, consider our effectiveness for God, we base our value on how we measure up to the world's criteria, don't we? We don't often sit and think and consider ourselves and consider our usefulness for the Lord in the criteria of God. We often look at everyone else around us. We see other people that are serving. We see other people that maybe we view that God are using or people that we maybe view in our own mindset view that maybe they're successful or God is doing something with them. And so we look at them and we compare ourselves to them, but God doesn't think in that way at all. And so in one sense, it is good for us because uh, we, we do measure ourselves in that way. And so we can eliminate that from our mindset. Listen, I don't have to measure up to anybody else's criteria. You say, Pastor, like, uh, you know, you don't ever struggle with that. You want, <laughs> I'll tell you the people who struggle the most with measuring themselves against others is probably pastors, to tell you the truth. That's why when you go to like pastors meetings, they're always like, how many people you got, you know? Because why well, they're comparing each other. That's all it is. And for all of us, we struggle with this. But I want to tell you today, that's not the way to measure yourself. That's not the way to look at yourself. That's not the way to understand your identity, your identity to God is not in how you look and how you present yourself or the things that you can do. God only cares about your heart. The Hebrew word here means the inner person, the mind, the will, uh, the heart, the emotions, the understanding, who you are inside. I, I don't know who that is, but you know who, who you are. You know who God created you to be. You know your innermost beings. And God knows your heart. He knows your loyalties. He knows your true inner character. And that's why God here is trying to blow up the idea uh, of, of looking at the outside appearance because God only cares about what matters, and that is your heart. Now, we've all been exposed to people who revealed truly what was going on inside of them in an unexpected way. Have you ever had that? Someone you were around and you thought you knew who they were, and then in a moment of stress, or a moment of, of crisis or anxiety, they turn into this person that you've never seen before? You remember, have you ever had that happen? Maybe you've, maybe you've been that person, you know? And you're like, what just happened? Well, what did they do? They revealed who they really were. They revealed who they really were. I'll never forget this. This is a quick story. Uh, when I was uh, first in ministry, we had a church softball team. Not here, but at, at my first church. And we had a softball team, and, and uh, we, were, we were so good. Uh, and um, and we, I love baseball. Softball is a very, well, it's not even a close second, but it's something to do, you know? And, uh, and so we played softball. I remember this guy in our church, he was like involved in some leadership stuff. I really respected him. And uh, I remember he struck out in slow pitch softball. Remember that? I, not remember that. You don't remember that. I remember that. Uh, <laughs> It was weird. He struck out in slow pitch softball, and that guy picked up the bat, threw it on the fence, and just started like profanity, man. This guy in our church. And all of us, we're, you know, we're on the team. We're like, first of all, we're like, whoa, he just struck out in slow pitch softball. And then he just started just cursing. And we were like, oh, man, like, where did that come from? And I remember he came in, and he just, like, sat on the bench, like, and he just sat by himself, and no one went and talked to him. And I, I remember my eyes were open that day. That guy is not who I thought he was because what was inside came out. If you're a person full of grace and truth and love, you strike out in slow pitch softball, you're going to go give a high five to the pitcher, right? And they're like, man, great nine-foot arc. <laughs> you know, it was really great. 
you got me on that one. <laughs> uh, no, but what was inside came out. So we've all experienced that, okay? We've seen that happen. And that's why God says, I'm concerned about the heart. Because that's who you truly are. Not who you are sitting there right now, all looking nice and sitting there and got your Bible on your lap. God knows who you really are. God knows what's really in your mind, what's really in your heart, what you're really thinking, how you're judging other people, how you're judging yourself. God sees it. God sees it. I remember what Jesus said to a group of individuals who really looked good on the outside. He said, oh, generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. God does not care about how we look. He's interested in how we think. He's interested in how we live our lives, how, what flows from the inside. And so for you and I, if there's ever a hope or a desire for us to be spiritual leaders, to be someone that is uh, useful for the master, that can be used to make a difference for the glory of God, then you must pay attention to your heart because it reveals who you truly are and your life is going to be a reflection of where your values are. I've had a lot of people over the years say to me, you know, pastor, I want to have the right values in life. I remember one conversation in particular. I want to build my life around the right values. I want to build my life to make a difference for the Lord. But their life thus far has simply been decisions showing something completely differently than what they say. And so they'll say, this is what I want. But because of what's in their heart, their decisions are the complete opposite of that, honestly. And it's because of their heart. That's why King Solomon said that we are to keep our hearts with all diligence, because out of that and out of it are the issues of life. And so here we have this example and this story of David, someone who was small in appearance. He was humble in his occupation. A young person, we believe maybe around 15 years old at this point, but somebody who had above anything else, he did not have strength, he did not have height, he did not have uh, wisdom, he did not have life experience, but what he did have was a heart for God. And understand, David wasn't cultivating a heart for God because he hoped to be king one day, okay? He wasn't out there in the, in the fields like, oh man, one day I'm going to be king, so I better keep my heart right. No, 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 no. He had no idea what was to come. He had a heart that was right with God, later on described, of course, as a man and a king after God's own heart. He did it because it was the right thing to do, because he knew that's what he, that's what he should do. He should have a heart that is right with God. And so we see God choosing him and calling him to be the next king of Israel. I love verse 13. We'll close with this. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. What a moment that must have been. All of his brothers surrounding him, his big tall brothers, <laughs> all of them may be wondering what is so special about this, this brother of ours. And he anointed him, Samuel anointed him as the next king of Israel. And it says the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Something that would mark his life and his rule is the spirit of God. It happened in that moment. And it says Samuel rose up and he went to Ramah. David here is anointed, surrounded by his family, and the spirit of God comes upon him. And he receives the greatest gift in all of the world, and that is the spirit of God. I'm so thankful tonight that you and I have that same spirit of God in us. That because of the sacrifice and the death of our Savior, you and I can be made the righteousness of God in him and receive that Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us, correct us, and help us to have a heart for God. And that same spirit that is going to guide David and be so useful in his life to lead God's people in the way that they should be going is the same spirit that's available to us today. And that spirit, though it can be quenched, as we know in Scripture teaches us, that same spirit can lead us towards a heart that is pointed towards and pointed upwards towards our God. I guess if you don't get anything else tonight, would you get this thought? It's better... It is so much better to be anointed by God than to be appointed by men. It is so much better to be anointed by God than to have 
some person say, oh, I think they're going to do something great. It's so much better to have the Spirit of God. And that really gets to the heart of the message this evening, which is so very simple in this way. How's your heart today? How's your heart tonight? It is what matters most. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that you and I put ourselves in the position of David today. I think that's a problem we often have. We, we put ourselves into these biblical characters. Okay, this is a specific moment, a specific time, a specific place. But the, the principle remains for us is that the person that has a heart for God, that is pursuing after him, God can uniquely use your life to make a difference for his glory. But the problem is we so often live like Samuel and others who are so focused on the outward, we're so focused on our persona, we're so focused on our profile that we don't do any of the hard work within. Because it's hard work. If you've ever done some real soul searching, have you ever asked God, what's wrong with me? And had him tell you? (laughs) That's hard. That's hard work. But I tell you what, that's the answer to a sustainable, fulfilling, um, joyful Christian life is having a heart that is seeking after God. And so God's answer for a king and God's plan for you and I as Christians today is simply a heart after him, a heart after him. So tonight, let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed.